<laughs> okay, right, so um, my topic for tonight is the myth of the decline of the Episcopal Church. Uh, the myth of the decline of the Episcopal Church. I'm sure you've all sat and read endless stories, endless stories, over and over again about the fact that we're part of the main line and the main line's getting smaller. How many people have heard those stories? Can you first put your hands up? That's it. Absolutely everybody. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight that it's all untrue. Oh, wish me luck. Okay, right, so... <laughs> now, let's be fair to this narrative. Let's be fair. Um, the, the picture you get in the media is, is first of all, we're grouped with the main line. So that's the... The main line actually is a very opaque word uh, but for now let's, let's link ourselves with the United Church of Christ which has declined significantly it's now down to 1.1 million members the Presbyterians, that's another part of the main line they're down to 2.7 million uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church is down to 4.5 million and people say, well, we're down to less than 2 million, so therefore we're in decline. And the other part of this picture is it's been going on for years. People talk about the fact that it all started in the mid-1950s when there were over 3.5 million Episcopalians, and we're now down to 1,951,907. <laughs> <laughs> And then, if you really want to make yourself miserable, you, you, know, you can dig into these numbers and you end up with a picture where apparently, because of the age structure of our church, we would expect a natural decline of 19,000 members each year. So how can I, with a straight face, with my English accent, reassure you all that this is a myth? And that's what I'm going to try to in the next 10, 15 minutes or so. Well, okay, let me just start by saying that there are people who have a real interest in talking, this sounds very paradoxical, but it's true, talking up the decline. Do you know, there was a lovely moment uh, last year on the campus at Virginia Theological Seminary. Incidentally, just as a little parenthesis, you're all cordially invited down to the Holy Hill, as we call ourselves, down in northern Virginia. It's about two and a half hours from here. It is across a bay bridge. That's a dangerous bridge. It swings in the wind. Uh, and uh, just come and visit. You know, just come down for the day. Uh, and if you email me in advance, we'll put you in our guest housing. You know, bring a grandchild. Bring a friend. Make sure it's decent, of course. You know, I'm not suggesting anything here. Uh, and and just, <laughs> just come on down and uh, just visit. Uh, and I'll tell you one of the reasons why you should is because in our junior class, the median age of our seminarians is 27. Do you know, I'm standing in the line in the refectory and I stared at this seminarian in front of me and I said, Carlos, how old are you? And he looked up and he said, 21, Carlos. That's really young, I said. I can't remember 21. I mean, there he was, 21. And there were lots of them. You know, and what was very interesting with this very young demographic we have at the seminary. So we had on the campus last year, we had Bishop Mark Lawrence of South Carolina and Bishop John Shelby Spong, <laughs> retired Bishop of Newark. Now, let me just hasten to add, it wasn't at the same time. <laughs> We're called as Christians to be peacemakers. So we thought a couple of weeks between them would be advisable. So, but it was very interesting. As you can imagine, they gave very contrasting talks. Very contrasting. I mean, big differences. But one thing they both agreed about, one thing they were absolutely emphatic about, and one thing they focused on was that we were a declining church. Because both of them have an interest in that rhetoric. 
Now, I admire and like them both. Let me just say that. But why do they both have a vested interest in that? Well, it's because, from Bishop Lawrence's point of view, the Episcopal Church is declining because we've lost our sense of identity, we've lost our gospel commitment, we've lost our particularity as a people of God, uh, the conservative Christians are in the ascendancy, we're struggling because we've no longer got a strong biblical identity. That was his rhetoric, that was his argument. And Bishop Spong, he had a slightly different argument. His argument was, look, we live in an age where faith is implausible. Science has made it difficult. You can't believe in the electric light and at the same time in a God who performs miracles. So therefore we need to move beyond the God story of an incarnation, a trinity, a virgin birth, a resurrection. It was a long list, actually. <laughs> and therefore, to reach those in exile, that's his favourite met metaphor, we've got to actually adapt our faith and think differently about who we are. And that's the reason why we're declining. So it's interesting. Both left and right in our church agree that we're declining for slightly different reasons. One, we're not religious enough, and the other, we're too religious. Now, once you detect, this is called a hermeneutic of suspicion. <laughs> it sounds odd, doesn't it, really? Hermeneutic of suspicion. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, hermeneutic just means your theory of interpretation. Do you know, it's interesting with new vocab words. Um, the best way to learn a vocab word is to use it within five seconds of hearing it. It's like jokes. People say to me all the time, how do you remember jokes? It's really easy to remember jokes. You just tell it within two seconds of hearing it. So if you want to remember the word hermeneutic, now, of course, all the seminarians and priests and all that sort of stuff will be using that every day of the week, I'm sure. <laughs> you just need to turn to your neighbour now. In fact, do it. Just turn and say, I've got a hermeneutical problem with that. Just say that to each other, please. Just... <laughs> I've got a hermeneutical... There. That's very satisfying, isn't it? Yeah. So all you... The word just means, you know, interpretation. It's actually an utterly useless vocab word. Okay, right, so... Uh, do you know, and the same principle applies to jokes. Do you know that joke? I like visual jokes. Uh, things like, um, you know, what's this? <laughs> and the answer is a pea on a fork. <laughs> it, it works better, best if you're about eight, actually. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll just tell you one more. This is... This, this was, for ages, was my son's favourite joke. Uh, a guy drives into a neighbourhood and accidentally runs over a cat. It's a sad joke, actually. And so the driver gets out of the car, walks up to the nearest house and rings the doorbell and says, look, I'm sorry, I just ran over a cat. And the guy standing at the door says, well, what's a cat look like? And the driver thinks for a moment and says, a bit like this. <laughs> And then the guy says, well, no, 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 no. Before that, what did the cat look like before that? And the driver thinks for a moment and says, well, a bit like this. <laughs> Do you know? so, so if you want to remember that joke, what you have to do is, whoever you're driving home with tonight or tomorrow morning, you just have to tell that joke to each other. Very good. You just have to tell that joke to somebody, you'll remember it forever. Anyway, right. Yes, that's right, very good, you remembered it, yes. You aren't supposed to do it while I'm talking, is it? Okay, so my point is that there are some people who have a vested interest in talking up our decline. And they're doing so for political reasons. They've got a, an agenda, and they want to persuade us to change, and they are very uncomfortable where we all are. And therefore, they speak out of that vested interest and suggest that we need to modify our beliefs, modify our behavior, think differently, be different, and as a result, we will change and start growing. And so you have the left arguing for uh, a 
a radical reorientation of our beliefs, and you have the right arguing for a recovery of traditional belief. Now, once you see that this talk of decline comes from a particular worldview, or particular worldviews, uh, perhaps it's time just to revisit the numbers. And it's very interesting talking to your bishop tonight. The Diocese of Delaware was growing all the way through the 90s, right up to 2005. So actually, you're sitting in a diocese that was growing until relatively recently. If you look at the statistics for the Episcopal Church, now, membership numbers are worth really unhelpful because, I mean, the weird thing about being a member of the Episcopal Church is you're a member if you get baptised, and you're a member if you transfer, and then you've got to be a member in good standing to vote in a general meeting, which is ideally pledge, or actually I don't think pledging is required for good standing. You ought to take the Eucharist at least once a month. I mean, as you know, one interesting thing about Episcopalians is membership's very fluid. Have you noticed in the typical, your members, it's about a third of your members who turn up and a different third. I suspect they all call each other up. Sure to turn to go, you know. <laughs> okay, and the, and the other interesting thing about the Episcopal Church is we're a winter religion. I mean, you, nobody comes over the summer. They all take a vacation from God. Um, okay, right, so membership's tricky. Membership, but average Sunday attendance, let's take that number. We started keeping average Sunday attendance numbers in 1991. From 1991 to 2001, the Episcopal Church grew by, not very much, 18,000 members nationally. But it did grow. Unlike the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the United Church of Christ, we got bigger. When I arrived at Hartford Seminary in the year 2001, Hartford Seminary's got one of the finest congregational studies teams. Of a, it's a weird seminary. A, a faculty of 15, three are Muslims, <laughs> and six are sociologists. There you are. So, but it was very interesting. So I spent all this time talking to congregational studies specialists. I remember having long conversations with Nancy Amman. These are the greats in this discipline. And the big puzzle in the year 2000 was why two denominations, two denominations were bucking the decline trend of the main line. And they were the Episcopal Church and the Lutherans. Really interesting. Now, we had a problem for some reason in 2002. Membership declined by, ASA declined by 11,000. And then in 2003, we elected a bishop, you might have heard. Okay. Now, I'll tell you where I think we are. I think we're coming to the end of sex. I think we might start, stop, stop talking about human intimacy for a bit. Which would be great, wouldn't it, really? There are lots of other things to talk about. I think we're, that season's coming to the end. I'll tell you, and the data is increasingly showing that's the case. Because what we're now seeing is the people leaving the Episcopal Church aren't doing so over issues around human sexuality. In fact, the bigger threat now and into the future is not human sexuality at all, but the bigger threat is old-fashioned secularization. In other words, it's Starbucks, it's golf, it's the Church of the Holy Comforter <laughs> on a Sunday morning when you pull it up over yourself and think, oh, I'll have another couple of hours in bed. That is the bigger risk to our church. It's very interesting. But what's also interesting is deep down into those numbers in the 90s, why were we bucking the decline of the main line? What was really going on? Well, I'll tell you what was going on. We have a number of things going for us which our Methodists and our Presbyterians and the United Church of Christ congregations in particular don't have. 
The first thing we have going for us is we have at least two services. Almost all congregations have at least two services, a right one, right two. A traditional, traditional language, more contemporary language. I mean, that's a fairly staple feature of many Episcopal churches. 